Hello, and welcome to the RoboJacket software training ROS video series. In these videos, we're going to be introducing you to ROS, the robot operating system. We'll cover the tools and concepts that you'll need to know to get started working on RoboJacket's projects. Now, ROS is an operating system by name, but it's not an operating system in the way that you're probably used to thinking. It doesn't replace Windows or Linux or OS X or anything like that. It's instead a software framework. It's a collection of tools, libraries, and standards that are all focused on collaborative robotics development. It's all geared towards making it easier to build robots as a team, and it's been very successful at that. Many of the top uh, universities and companies have all started using ROS as the foundation for their robotics projects. Now, in addition to being a set of software tools, ROS also has a very active community. So the first two things to know about ROS are that if you ever have questions or you're trying to learn more about the system and about how it works, you have two resources you can go to right off the bat. The first is the wiki. You can find this at wiki.ros.org. And this is the primary place to find documentation for packages, the ROS system in general, and the design principles that guide it. The second resource is the answers forum. Uh, you can find this at answers.ros.org. And this is a Stack Exchange style question answer site where you can post questions and other ROS users and even ROS developers will be there to help answer your questions and help you figure out how to do whatever it is you're trying to do inside of ROS. And now to start talking about ROS for our purposes, the central concept that we need to cover is the ROS graph. ROS takes these big complicated robotics projects and breaks them into smaller purpose-driven pieces. Instead of having one big program that handles all the behavior for a robot, we have many smaller programs, each of which only handles a piece of the problem. In ROS, we call each of these programs a node, and an individual robot will take many, many nodes to actually get it up and running. Each node has a single purpose. So we might have a node that pulls images off a camera, and that will be separate from the node that processes those images in some way, and that will be separate from the node that actually lets us view those images in a window. Each of these three nodes is an individual program running on our machine, and they're working together to get a larger task done. The real power behind this approach is that we can swap out different implementations for each of these nodes without having to recompile the whole code base and without the other nodes really noticing the change. So if we have another node that pulls in images from a different kind of camera, we can swap out these two nodes without having to change the data processing node or the image viewing node at all. Each individual node is independent from the other nodes running around it. Now to get data between these nodes, there are a variety of different ways we can connect them. But the simplest and most common is called a topic. Topics have a few key properties that we need to cover. The first of which is that they are one-way communication channels. So when you have a connection between two nodes, let's say we have node A and node B and a topic connecting them, Data only goes in one direction on that topic. So information can only be sent from A to B in this case. Any node that is sending information is called a publisher. And any node that is receiving information from that topic is called a subscriber for that topic. Now these labels only pertain to that node for that specific topic. So if one node has multiple topic connections, it might be a publisher for some of those topics and a subscriber for other topics. And if we wanted to have nodes with two-way communication between them, we would need two separate topics that are configured in opposite directions. So the first node would be a publisher for one topic and a subscriber for the other, and vice versa for the other node. The second important property about topics is that they are many-to-many. -many. This means that any individual topic can have as many publishers and as many subscribers as you want. Every bit of information that is sent from each publisher is received by all of the subscribers. Now, it's not often where you'll see this kind of setup where you have many publishers and many subscribers on the same topic, but it is possible. More commonly, you'll see situations where you have one publisher going out to multiple subscribers or many publishers coming down and syncing their information into a single subscriber. The key is that all of these are possible, and so don't think of topics as only connecting one node to one other node. There might be more publishers, and there might be more subscribers. So topics are the connections, the channels across which nodes can talk, but what does the information actually look like when it's getting sent across those topics? Well, 
that data is broken up into structured chunks that we call messages. The first important thing about messages is that they are structured. This means a message has an associated type that explains its layout. And that type is broken down into fields, where every field has a name and a type of the data associated with it. These fields are just like variables in any programming language. They have a name associated with them so that you know which one you're talking about, and they have a type associated with them so that you know what kind of data they hold. All the common data types are available, different sizes of integral numbers, different sizes of floating point numbers, you've got strings and arrays and all that are represented. And fields can use message types as their field type, so you can nest these structures together. You could create a three-dimensional vector message with x, y, and z fields within it, and then create a message that uses vector3 as one of its field types. Now topics are associated with message types. So every message that goes across a given topic has to be of the same type. So if I have a topic that sends image messages, then all of the messages that come across it have to be image messages. We can't mix and match on the same topic. So if you have a node that needs to send out multiple kinds of information, then it needs to publish multiple topics, where each topic has a different message type associated with it. So one might be images, one might be settings, etc. The reason that this is important is that when a, another node subscribes to that topic, they know what kind of information they're getting without us having to send a bunch of extra information alongside every single message. The message does not have to describe its own structure because both endpoints already know what structure they're expecting. But having these predefined structures and having them associated with topics also means that we now have an interface mechanism for decoupling nodes in a clean way. See, this subscriber node doesn't need to know anything about the specific publisher node because all it cares about is that there is a topic that is sending image messages into it. This could be a camera, it could be a video, I could be drawing them by hand for every frame, it doesn't matter. The subscriber node just sees image messages coming in and it already understands how to use image messages. So there is a strong relationship between topics and message types. And so that's the ROS graph. We have nodes connected by topics across which messages are being sent. Now, like I said earlier, there are other things we can connect nodes with besides topics, but we'll get into those later. The other important thing about the ROS graph to mention now is the naming scheme. We need to have names so that we can refer to specific elements of this node graph, both for talking with each other and for telling the computer what to do with them. ROS names look a little bit like file paths, in that they're different pieces put together with slashes in between them. So we might see a node name uh, that looks like this. It'll have a forward slash, and it might be called something like camera1. And now every time we give the computer the name slash camera1, it knows that we're talking about this specific node. Now the reason we join them together with these slashes is because that creates namespaces. So this topic could be called camera1 slash images, and that name is defining a relationship between this topic and this node. This topic lives within the camera one namespace. It lives within the namespace for this node. Now this is useful because we can create another node of the same type, but with a different namespace, and now their topics won't clash because now this topic can be called camera two images and they won't collide with each other. The code inside of this node doesn't need to worry about handling name collisions because that can be solved externally through these namespaces. But if the code doesn't know what its final name is going to be, how does it actually refer to these topics? Well, we have a way within this naming scheme to refer to our node's private namespace, no matter what it ends up being at runtime. And so you'll see within the code for this camera node, you would see something like tilde slash images. And this tilde says that this is the private namespace prefix. So at runtime, when this node goes to work with the tilde slash images topic, it will get converted to whatever the appropriate name actually is 
for that instance of the node. For this node, it'll get translated to camera one slash images. And for this node, it'll get translated to camera two slash images. And that's how this namespace system helps us work with these large complicated systems. In our code, we can be a little bit more generic and that gives us the flexibility at runtime to organize things in a clean way. Now, namespaces are not just for associating topics with nodes. Any name can have as many namespaces as you want. So if you have multiple nodes that work together, you can cluster them into a namespace. So if both of these nodes were for path planning or something like that, right, then I can group them into a path planning namespace just by having both of their names be path planning slash whatever their specific name wants to be. Namespaces let us group any elements together. Now there's one more thing we need to talk about in this video, and that's ROS master. So ROS is this naturally distributed system where our code is broken up into different programs, and these nodes are talking to each other through topics that have a predefined structure. But there's one part of ROS that is still very centralized, and that's the ROS master. See, when you have a distributed system like the ROS graph, you can run into a problem that we call discoverability. How does one node know how to connect to the other nodes? Yes, we conceptually understand that they're both trying to communicate with the same topic, but how does that end up translating into actual network communication between those programs? And that's where the ROS master comes in. The ROS master's job is to keep track of what the state of the graph is what nodes exist, and what topics each of those nodes are trying to communicate with, and how. So anytime a node wants to inspect or interact with the ROS graph for the running system, it has to coordinate with the ROS master. And this starts as soon as the node is created. So when a node pops up, it needs to reach out to the ROS master and say initially, like, hey, I'm a new node, I exist and master updates its understanding of the graph and says, cool, we've got a new node. It's called A. And now A wants to advertise that it's going to be able to publish to a topic name. So it'll tell the master, hey, I'm uh, looking to publish messages onto the pose topic. And so master will go, okay, now master has a little understanding inside of it that says, okay, we have A and it's publishing on a pose topic but there's nobody subscribed to that, so there's no connections that actually need to be made. Now B shows up, and it starts talking back and forth with Master, and it says, hey, I'm a new node. Master says, cool, there's a new node. And then B says, I want to subscribe to a topic called Pose. And the Master updates everything and says, okay, now B is subscribing to that Pose topic. And now Master can tell these nodes, you guys need to make a network connection with each other. Here's where to find each other, and you're going to be setting up on the Pose topic with this message type. And now those nodes can directly connect to each other. Now the important thing is all of the messages that A sends over pose to B don't go through master. They go directly between each other. Master is only used for establishing the connections between these nodes, helping them find each other. Once they know where each other are, they can talk directly to each other without getting master involved. So don't think that all of the data has to get routed to some central thing and then sent out to all of the subscribers. Master is only for handling discoverability. Now this might seem like a deep peek under the hood for your first video on ROS, but ROS master is something that you're going to have to run all the time, and so I wanna make sure you understand what it's doing. So whenever you're trying to run ROS nodes or tools, you're going to need to make sure that there's an instance of ROS master running. And the command we use to do that is called ROS core. The ROS core command will boot up an instance of ROS master along with a couple other small things. And it's important that you do this every time you are going to run a ROS system. Now we don't want to waste a whole terminal just to run ROS core. So you'll often see people run it like this, ROS core space ampersand. And this ampersand is just a common Linux thing that tells the terminal to run this command in the background. So running ROS core ampersand will launch ROS core in the background. And it'll keep running there no matter what we do with our terminal after that. Uh, until we kill that process either using its process ID or with the system monitor tool. So this is something you'll need to do every time you boot up your computer to work with ROS. But now you know how it works and what it's actually doing. And that's everything for this video. We've covered what ROS is, how the ROS graph is structured, how we handle naming in the ROS graph, and what the purpose of ROS master is and how to run it.
In the next video, we'll cover how to use the common command line tools for interacting with a Roth system.